and with me today is Jane Pointer. She is an author, a speaker, and the president of Paragon Space Development Corporation, which creates technologies for extreme environments like outer space and underwater. Very cool. Yeah. <laughs> the first question that I have for you is, is really about you know, life's journey and path, and I'm wondering, is you, fulfilling your dream is it something that you knew exactly what you wanted to do and got there? Or it seems to me oftentimes it's an intriguing pattern of or, or path in which we go in all these different directions and somehow they all come together and make a lot of sense later. Yeah, I think the latter is probably the case. No, I did not grow up imagining I was going to be the president of an aerospace company, nor somebody who lived inside Biosphere 2. Uh, three-acre glass and seal structure that's a completely sealed enclosure mm -hmm. that con contained a rainforest, it had a savanna, an ocean, a marsh, a desert, and then of course it had a human habitat where, where eight of us lived for right. two years and 20 minutes, <laughs> and also an agriculture where we grew our food. Um, and so that, being able to live inside Biosphere 2, was just a seminal moment. I mean, it was really a pivotal moment in my life. I mean, it was just an extraordinary right. experience and opened my eyes to so many huge visions. I would say that I latch on to really cool visions and then I just can't let go. Okay. And so Biosphere 2 was this fantastic vision. It was, can you create a miniature Earth? Can human beings make a whole world that human beings can live in? And the original concept was that we would be able to use biospheres like Biosphere 2 Mm -hmm. similar, let's say, anyway, right. somewhere like on Mars, for instance, so it would be a mm -hmm. prototype for a space base, but it would also be an experimental station where we could really learn how the Earth works. You know, I thought the whole Biosphere 2 was to see how to do more sustainable living, but you were, it was actually, the vision was more grand than even that. Oh, yeah, it was, it. it was, it was a huge vision. I mean, mm -hmm. sustainable living, in a sense, was part of the vision because you have to live sustainably in order to, I mean, that's the very mm -hmm. definition of mm -hmm. a biosphere. Right. And this is what today we're, we're struggling with, I think, as a culture, is to bring back into our culture the notion that we are part of a biosphere, that we're not separate, that, you know, the, the mm -hmm. earth is not our playground to do whatever we want with. Mm -hmm. We are part of the living system. Whether mm -hmm. we like it or not, we are. Mm -hmm. We depend on it, and what we do to it Huh, greatly affects, <laughs> eventually it'll affect our way of life as well. So right. that, that was, yes, sustainable living was part of the vision for, for the people inside to live sustainably, but it was really about having an entirely biologically based system of life support that we understood in detail. Mm -hmm. A miniature world, a miniature mm -hmm. earth. Okay, so tell us about living for two years and 20 minutes mm. <laughs> inside a contained environment with eight people. Now, how well did you know them going in and what sorts of lessons did you learn from that process? Wow, so yeah, I I thought I pretty well, m much knew everybody that was going inside Biosphere 2. I mean, there was eight of us, four men and four women. Okay. And a number of them, most of them actually, I had worked for years even. Mm-hmm. Uh, in very close environments. So part of the training was going into the outback of Australia where I lived for a year, living on a research boat out in the middle of the ocean for months at a time. And I was on that boat for a year. Okay. And so during that time, I also lived and worked with some of the other Biospherians, some of the other people lived inside Biosphere too. That is a pretty intense experience in and of itself. Mm -hmm. So I mm -hmm. thought I knew everybody. <laughs> I thought I knew myself. I mean, that's the, that's the honest yes. truth. I mean, when I, I really thought that when I went into Biosphere 2, oh, we all know each other. We're all best friends. We'll right. work it out. Right. What did you learn about yourself that you didn't know hmm. prior to going in? Well, you know, we all carry around a lot of baggage. <laughs> yes, we do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was really my first real experience of having to deal with that because I mean I honestly thought I was going mad at one point and so much so that I, I ended up getting my own professional psychologist to help me through it because it was so a little you crazy. Have, you, have, you were able to tap into the outside through right. computers. So yeah, so, so, so the poor psychologist was you know on the <laughs> phone she couldn't even see us right. inside. And, uh, you needed Skype. 
<laughs> right. We needed Skype. We barely had email at the time. You got to remember, this was in the early '90s, right? When cell phones oh, were the size of suitcases. Yes. You were going mad because you feeling claustrophobic. You needed to get out, or you had changed what your vision you, was, or what was. Hey, hey, uh, yeah, kind of all of that. So have, you, you've been on a long road trip. <laughs> yeah. yeah. By the end of it, you're like, get me out of here before I kill you. I mean, you know, maybe if you're traveling with the right person, you don't get out of the car feeling like that. But sometimes you do. Yes. And it was like that inside Biosphere 2, but much more so because you couldn't get out of the car. You were stuck in there for the whole two years. So it was partially other people because it is only eight of you and you see the same people over and over again and there is no right. dilution of that. Uh, it's just, you know, it's odd. Living in isolation, it turns out that our experience inside Biosphere 2 is not at all uncommon. Uh, we broke into two factions, 4 and 4, which was really entrenched. I mean, it was horrible, actually. Really nasty. Were they, were they men two and men women? And, no, it was two, two men and two. Okay. It was two and two on both sides. So there was no gender, there was no, you know, sexuality Age. involved. Okay. None of that was involved. I, it, it was really bizarre, and in fact, two of my best friends were on the other side of the divide, which was also incredibly painful. And it, it turns out that that actually is what happens in isolation. It happens in the Antarctic, mm, it happens in space. It's okay. just something that happens. And being in isolation just really isn't good for people. It I doesn't do good so. things. I mean, you know, on a personal level, it was, it was a bit what I imagine it must be like having a monastic experience if you're not prepared for it. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, you, it's not only do you not have the other people that you're used to having, I mean, particularly in the Western world, where we're bombarded mm -hmm. all day long with mm -hmm. just stuff going on. Yes. And you're not, in a situation like that, you are not. All I carried around with me all day long was a pair of pruning shears and a radio, two-way radio. That was it. That's all I had. That's all I had to keep track of. And, you know, I, Biosphere 2 was very big, it was beautiful, it was varied, but after a while, yeah. kind of, you know, is there another rainforest I can go visit? <laughs> was, there a, was there a lot of work you had to do? Oh, yeah, so, yeah, So, yeah. I mean, were you kind of, was there stress involved in, will we get this done in time to make enough, you know, to have food for... Yeah, there was that too, absolutely. And we were, I mean, there, was, there were lots of stresses. Um, so, there were all kinds of things acting on our psychology and our emotional mm -hmm. condition. So there was just the effect of being isolated. That was one part. Another part was that we were hungry all the time. I kind of knew going in it was going to be touch and go. And then uh, we had two El Nino years back to back. And El Nino is a weather condition that spreads mm -hmm. over this part of the country. Of course, it's meant to be sunny here. That's why we're, we put the biosphere in Arizona. Yes. And in an El Nino year, it brings a lot of clouds and rain. And so we had two years with lowest light levels on Arizona oh. history. So of course that affects the plants and their productivity. Sure. So uh, that was one reason why we were hungry. And so that of course was pretty tough. And uh, mm -hmm. when we still had a sense of, sense of humor, we called it Grumposphere 2. <laughs> the other thing that happened was, was um, we had an unexpected oxygen loss issue, which we eventually figured out what the problem was. Um, but the oxygen went down pretty low. It went down to 14.2%. Of course, ambient is 21. So that's about the level of going to Lhasa, somewhere like that in the Himalayas. And, you know, if you get adapted to it, it's fine. But, but we it weren't. Kind of well, no, we weren't adapting to it. And we think that's because we were hungry. So uh, we okay. didn't adapt to, to the, uh, the high elevation effectively. Oh, my goodness, it makes you feel terrible. Yes, I can imagine. Ew, ugh. <laughs> so... <laughs> and it gives you mood swings. Mm -hmm. Low oxygen makes you moody anyway. So you've got, you know, you're moody because of the because of the mood swings. You're moody because you haven't got enough to eat. Yes. You're moody because your other biospherians are driving you nuts. Mm -hmm. You're moody because you can't go out to dinner. And so, yeah. <laughs> and know, are you friends all, you're now? Like, are you friends now? Or it was like that was well, enough. <laughs> I married one of them, so I guess oh, we're friends. Okay.